So I'm going to start off by uh, thank you, Brian, for introducing the Blue Flag Scheme. Uh, I had the chance to talk with Brian and Paul Bishop in Erie this last February uh, in a conversation about the Blue Flag Scheme and some of the work that we're doing with the Schooner Adventures. And that February, 
And we went, that was the first week of February, went back to Port Townsend, Washington, in the Seattle area, in the Pacific Northwest. An unusually clear day, the ship hauled out. We, um, I had the incredible honor, privilege, and uh, responsibility to buy the $200 bottle of single malt Scotch whiskey to celebrate uh, the Venturous's 100th birthday. The ship was hauled out and we had just completed the largest restoration phase in um, the complete hull restoration of the ship. And we stood up with a team of shipwrights and volunteers, planners, and supporters with a, um, with a, a toast of whiskey for the ship as we had just fastened in the last plank, 2,000 lineal feet of planking we had replaced that last winter. And we gave a toast to the ship, looking forward to its next century of sailing. And we spoke quite intentionally about um, how we continue to use this ship, a National Historic Landmark 100-year-old ship that's been engaged, inspiring and empowering an inclusive community for at least the last 25 years while our organization has owned the ship, and uh, how to uh, protect our marine environmental, our, our marine environment. And so that kind of starts our, our conversation for this, for this afternoon, where blue meets green, and how we use the Schooner Adventures, this 100-year-old ship, as a platform for engaging the thousands of people that come sailing aboard her each year, and specifically engaging the more broad maritime industry in emerging, resilient, sustainable green technology on board. And it's been a really uh, incredible story. Now, I'll start just real quickly a little bit about the ship, 40 meter, 133 foot um, schooner, gaff topsail schooner. She was launched in 1913 uh, in East Booth Bay Harbor, Maine. Uh, BB Cronenshield design is kind of a cross between a Gloucester fishing schooner and a yacht. Young aristocrat um, had the ship built. What's interesting to note, her original interior included a standard gasoline engine and a generator with electric lights. So for 1913, that's emerging technology. And um, uh, we'd like to say that she's one of the world's first hydrants. Her maiden voyage brought her on an Arctic expedition. The goal was to find a bowhead whale specimen for the American Museum of Natural History. It was a joint venture between the museum and John Borden. It was an unsuccessful trip in that they were late. It was an early winter. I don't know if folks know the story of the Carla was also on that Arctic exploration, was ahead of adventurous, uh, got through the Bering Strait, and was iced in. The ship was lost, and many of its crew, I think three out of the dozen or so, survived. Adventurous turned back to the Pribilof Islands and was sold to the San Francisco bar pilots. And she worked as a bar pilot schooner in San Francisco, 1914 until 1939, actively uh, sailing as a bar pilot. And you'll notice, and just for the sake of thinking about, uh, about history and and how we looked to our rooted history, you'll notice that her rig was significantly reduced, bowsprit, our pony rig was put in. We went from sailing with a large crew to four or so uh, pilots and folks, mostly just stationed off of the Golden Gate waiting for ships to come back and forth. World War II came and the ship was inscripted by the US Navy to patrol the coast. Um, she earned five chevrons from the Secretary of the Navy, each one for each six months of service. It was then used as motor vessels came in uh, to fat as bar pilots would then use um, uh, for sail training, Navy, Coast Guard, and Sea Scouts. The ship was brought to Seattle in 1952, changed hands a couple of times, and began her life as a sail training vessel. Again, you can notice a number of the different iterations of the rig and the deck layout. This was, these were some awful years. We call that the school bus uh, <laughs> up on deck. It was rough. Um, Ernestine Bennett, the woman up here in the corner, brought a group of Girl Scouts on in the early 60s and fell in love with the ship. She moved up into the Seattle area and invested much of her life and money into restoring the ship and continuing sail training. So one of the early sail training vessels. Her and um, famed schooner captain, Captain uh, Adrian Renault, brought the ship back to her original rig and in 1989 was awarded the highest level of historic recognition in the United States as a U.S. National Historic Landmark, 1989. 91-92, the ship was turned over to Sound Experience. It's a nonprofit organization that um, was started by a former uh, Clearwater captain um, who, uh, with a program started by famed folk musician and activist Pete Seeger. 
developing environmental education on the Hudson River. And Morley Hoarder decided he wanted to come back to his home waters in Puget Sound and start a similar program out there with that idea that you, don't, you won't take care of anything that you don't have a connection to. So bringing students, as many students as you can, out on the water to then care for the, for the environment. You'll notice the blue flag up there. Adventurous was the first US uh, vessel enrolled in the blue flag program. And we're engaged in formal environmental and sustainability education, mostly with youth, uh, but all the way up uh, through to elders and corporate groups and the like. The nonprofit owns and operates the organization. Again, for the last 25 years, we serve three to 5,000 participants each year in formal environmental education programs. Uh, yeah, upwards of 10,000 with festivals and dockside tours and the like that are engaged in the ship. And you notice a very specific mission, engaging, inspiring, and empowering an inclusive community to make a difference for the future of Puget Sound. Each time the ship is underway, actually all year long, even through our restoration periods, we are engaged in formal environmental education and awareness. So very mission-driven organization and ship. So the idea was, as part of this, um, uh, the strategic plan process that came through is ensure that a 50-year standard of the ship restoration through the completion of what's the Centennial Restoration Project. We're coming up on 100 years, um, about five years ago, and we, we launched formally into the Centennial Restoration Project. Now, the ship is committed to work 200 days a year, and so we can only do our restoration uh, in four-month periods. So, real quickly, the extent of work that we've done over the last five years uh, we have one project left to do to finish the starboard side of the ship and she'll meet that 50 year standard. So extensive amount of work getting done over the last five years to ensure that she continues to sail. And I'm speaking to this particularly because that this idea of sustainability is not just green technology, but it's actually working into the future. And in the strategic planning process, you'll notice specifically this value, really widely held value of modeling low impact sustainable living on board the ship. And that's something that the organization has taken quite seriously for the last number of years. And there's a whole host of current best management practices that we've been involved in, supporting the Blue Flag program, um, looking really closely at our energy needs. We're engaged in this, um, uh, this kind of experiment with eco bottom paint in coordination with Headed paint. Washington State in the U.S. is the first state and the only state to phase out and ban copper-based bottom paint. And we're exempt from that particular law, but we're using the ship as an opportunity to learn about how it's working on wooden vessels. So right now, with a brand new port side and the starboard side we have to do, we painted half the ship with water-based, eco-based bottom paint. And when I haul the boat out next week, when I get home, we'll have this great side-by-side -side comparison. One of the few things that we do to all of our wood products, you know, last year was 240 frame sections, 2,000 lineal feet of planking. All of that wood is FSC certified, Forest Stewardship Council. Uh, it's a widely recognized international certification process for wood harvested from uh, sustainable sources. And then certainly the ship's engaged in environmental sustainability education. So all of this are great best management practices. We're engaged in uh, kind of helping to try and move the industry forward and be a model for sustainability in the Blue Flag program. But we got to the point where we wanted to go further, where we, we wanted to look at how the ship moves forward into its next century, being an absolute model for sustainable and emerging technology. And so if you look at the land-built side of green, the green building industry, it's really quite well organized. So if you were to do a Google search, if you wanted to build a green home or a green building, you do a Google search, green building. In the first three hits, you would find a tremendous amount, all the information that you would need in terms of technology, architects and engineers, all that you would need to be a built home. If you did the same in the marine industry, you'd be, you'd be hard pressed to find much at all. So we start asking these questions, if we want to be the greenest ship in the world, based on a historic platform, what technology is available, where is it being done, and its project manager, these are all the questions I'm asking, where do I find this information, who supports this, and really you're not going to find anything. And so the idea that came to mind is how do we, in the maritime industry, broadly now, not just the sail training industry, get more organized around green building and emerging technology. Now it's not to say that great stuff isn't happening out there, and there are some really great examples, but they're hard pressed to find. I was fortunate enough at that point to be awarded a fellowship through Toyota. 
which gave me the opportunity to work on a year-long project and engaging in some of these questions. And what I started was this process what we called where blue meets green. The idea was that we brought together leaders in the maritime industry in our region to talk specifically about what they're doing to move forward green technology in the maritime industry. And who we are having these conversations with is across the board. These are manufacturers, these are large and small shipyards and, and boat builders, these are large container ships, these are paint manufacturers, suppliers, the ports themselves, tribal fisheries, all coming together to talk about what is, these are all early adopters, what is the, the burgeoning new green industry in the maritime world. You know, very you know, structured, facilitated conversations. These are happening over a series of 12 months, various different ports, onboard the adventurous and other conferences. What do we envision? How do we accomplish it? And how is it that we start to collaborate around a more sustainable green maritime industry? There's a whole series of highlights that came out of these conversations. There's over 200 leaders in the industry, uh, mostly in the Puget Sound region, although um, I went outside the region a little bit as well. First and foremost was skills and education. How is it that we support a new industry without giving folks working in the marine trades or upcoming naval architects and engineers some background and skills? So who's going to install this brand new green, all new uh, refrigeration technology? Right? Who, who, who's installing the new battery technology, propulsion technology? The skills aren't there yet. Understanding the issues for sure. We live in these different watersheds and we know that there's you know, a microplastics issue, ocean acidification, these things keep coming up all the time. What is it about the maritime industry that's actually contributing to that? We don't, we don't know entirely. Or maybe it's not the, the, the worst offender of the issue in the waters of the Baltic Sea or the Puget Sound. And the maritime industry may not be the worst offender, but what are the issues? Where are the models and how do we share them? Who's doing this kind of work and where, how do we make them accessible to others that want to continue it? And what are the standards? In the US and internationally, we have lead standards in the green building industry. And there are those um, within the naval architect and marine engineering community uh, with IMO and AB, ABS and the like that are trying to come up with green standards, voluntary green, green lead-like standards for the maritime industry. You can imagine how difficult that is because you have everything from us, these sail training vessels, to containers, to cruise ships, to the recreational boating community. So those standards are going to be quite varied and that's a difficult process to come up with. And then advocacy. Again, so who's looking out for this? Who's pushing it? Who's helping to support funding mechanisms for this kind of thing? Not any of this is yet coordinated. What was interesting in all these series of conversations was that there's a, there were clear notions that um, collaborative approaches are working. The maritime industry is quite interdependent. Shipyards next to each other are utilizing each other all the time. There's a direct connection between manufacturers, suppliers, and others. But how do we start to collaborate with that interdependence across the industry? So where this process has led is um, actually Washington Sea Grant, the Sea Grant process, uh, which is funded by uh, NOAA. In, uh, in the U.S. federal government is now taking over the, the, this continued process. We're building an advisory board and essentially looking towards the green, uh, um, green building councils as a model in the maritime industry. And task force are coming together and are trying to figure out what the priorities are going to be. And on an industry-wide, industry start changing the conversation and supporting green technology in the industry. And then there's building models and pilot programs. And that's where Sound Experience and Adventurous is jumping in with both feet. It's something that we're calling the Living Ship Initiative. We are looking to use the Spooner Adventurous, the National Historic Platform, uh, to be a model, an experimental model, in using the highest standards of green building in the maritime industry. And we've chosen a process called the Living Building Challenge. This is something that has been put on by an organization called the International Living Future Institute. It is, the, it is the world's most stringent green building standard. And it's being utilized across the world. There are living buildings. The greenest uh, commercial building in the world was just built to these standards in Seattle. There are buildings in Australia. There are buildings in Poland, Bulgaria, UK, around the world. This challenge is being taken up. And they're incredibly stringent. And they're stringent to the point where, at first glance, you would say, this is impossible. And that's kind of the idea. 
the idea is that we start shifting thinking about how we deal with the built environment. It rewards early adopters. It's creating models for the future. It's stirring the pot. Again, there's, a, there's um, the idea is that you can't do that. Well, actually, we can. And let's, let's see how it, can, it gets done. Pulls the market forward. And different from a lot of the other green building standards, it really infuses this idea of beauty and inspiration. It uses this flower as a metaphor. There are seven specific performance areas, or petals that they call them. First is around site, so getting an idea about what is the site, what's the environment around you that you're going to affect. That's going to be quite different for a ship out at sea or even an inland boat than it is for a stationary building. And those are some interesting questions that we're asking. The goal is to get to net zero water that these structures are um, capturing all the 100% of their water needs, so none of, these, none of these buildings are tied into municipal water systems. Net zero energy, it's producing all the energy that it needs, right there. And zero combustion, which when we say stir the pot and start rethinking about how we deal with that. Now that's a lot easier for us because we are the world's first hybrid, right? Sail power. Um, and then we're, we're talking about some really interesting models and how we may go forward. Keen eye to health, air, sound qualities, living conditions. Materials is a big one. So we start thinking about all the materials that we use in buildings that we're using on board our ships. Uh, there's a whole list, these 13 chemicals, that are restricted from being used at all. PVC is one of them. Uh, Hydrochloro... Uh, HDFCs, essentially the refrigerants and the like, that are huge um, greenhouse, greenhouse gases. Uh, and that's that's a difficult process. So not, but so they have to fit um, all of our regulations in the U.S. is the, the CFRs and IMO standards and the like. Now there are some exceptions based on that, but that's a, that's one of the more difficult processes. That there's a clear access in education, and then that there's beauty involved. And I don't think we have a problem covering that on board the ship. What's really interesting about this process is that it is it, it's a tool for change, let alone just a standard. A lot of buildings go through the leave process and they get a sticker on the window and says, this is a green building, done. That's not the point of this. The point is to actually pull the market forward. If the technology doesn't exist, then it's your responsibility to meet the living building criteria. If the technology doesn't exist yet and you can't install it, then it is your responsibility to do advocacy, either with municipalities or technology manufacturers, to advocate for the technology to change or for regulation to change to support it. It's actually illegal to build most um, living buildings in the U.S. In the state of Colorado, you're not allowed to capture any water. It's illegal to capture water. So there's regulation that's going to be involved in this as well. And we're working quite, clo quite closely with our uh, U.S. inspection team in how this is going to work as well. This process has now been funded over the next three years. We have a, a series of funders that are funding this planning process. You can imagine this is going to be a multi-year incremental approach to change the ship. We're looking at retrofitting the entire ship system. Everything from propulsion, black water, um, uh, cooking, heating, everything is going to have to meet this new standard. So this is going to be an incremental phase and approach. We're committed to sail you know, those 200 days a year. And as well as how we do fundraising, we're going to have to do this in incremental in the incremental stage. So one of the first goals here is we have to go through this design process. And I have a team of architects and engineers and operators that meet monthly and we're going through each system and redesigning the system. We're doing demonstration projects along the way so we can uh, start speaking to the industry, start speaking to our participants about kind of the work and technology we're starting to use. We're looking at how the technology incorporates into our environmental education program working with other uh, education foundations around the country, around the world, and how they're using technology as a basis for learning about environmental ed. And marine trades workforce development. So we have the opportunity to work with existing marine trades programs to start building an education paradigm around it. Our, like I said, our design team is, is meeting monthly. We're working on a series of these demonstration projects. We have a new rainwater reclamation. The bottom plate I spoke about, we're moving away from um, uh, zinc sacrificial anodes and moving towards aluminum. And this was our first year, and so I'm eager and anxious. I dove on them this summer, and they were looking great. I highly recommend looking into aluminum anodes. And zinc is a, is a, uh, um, a 
difficult chemical in the marine, uh, for the marine environment. Uh, disassembling this uh, very unsafe and old 120 um, uh, DC system that we've had on board for a long time, converting all over to LED lights. It's a, it's a, there's a little bit of money invested, but the price in LED are coming down so much, it makes no sense not to have LED lights on board your ship. And the big project that we're working on this, this winter is an all-new refrigeration system. It's the largest energy draw on board the ship. And we're using new technology. We're, we're using, um, what we're designing right now are vacuum sealed with uh, the technology called aerogel for insulation. You get an R50 factor in one inch, where some of the four and six inch insulation, you might get a, uh, an R15. So incredible savings that you find just in insulation, as well as all the materials using in all new compressors, water cooled compressors and the like. And then all of the wiring and plumbing is going to have to meet red, red list issues. So PVC free um, coverings and wiring, um, the plumbing issues that we're using, the, the refrigerant that we're using, all has to meet these red list standards. So this is our, this is our big systems project that we're starting to work with this coming winter. We're developing new education. We're working with our education team as we're developing our new education standards and how we incorporate this into the education, formal education programs we're doing. And we did a pilot project this, this last fall, and we're building on it this winter, where we're starting to use the ship to enhance existing marine trade skills. So we have folks that are learning how to be system designers, installers, and shipyard workers, and teaching them about best management practices, the new technology that's coming through, and how to work with it. We did a, a three-day program with a series of uh, students in a, in a trades program and start engaging it. And this refrigeration program, this pilot program this coming winter, is uh, students from various programs are actually going to be uh, using the ship as a lab for their uh, EPA and ABYC certified courses in refrigeration. This design team we put together, meeting monthly, again, it's a series of different operators and marine architects and engineers. A whole group, there's actually four different naval architect and marine engineering firms that are serving on a collaborative design team. So these are all firms who are early adopters and find that sustainable and green technology are being called for, they're leading the industry, and they're working collaboratively with us together to kind of use this, it's, it's a low risk experimental platform for them. Uh, but we're getting all of the benefits of their expertise and their time and energy in putting this team together. This is the drawing back to the original interior of the ship. And uh, you notice the many different lives of the ship, the many different iterations. You can imagine the systems as well. We have a nonprofit's organizations owning and operating the ship over the last couple of years, leading to a, just a hodgepodge of crazy systems, sometimes even dumpster dived for parts. And so we're this mess of systems on board, we're now moving and organizing everything. So going through each of the pedals of the Living Building Challenge, organizing what, taking a tremendous amount of data that we've, you know, our engineers, our onboard engineers have been going through over the years, and putting them in an organized way so we can start looking at what the needs of the ship is within our general operating parameters and redesigning systems to those. This is a, taking a tremendous amount of work of our design team. The fun thing that we did just a couple weeks ago, we finished our sailing season, we, we downrigged for the season, and what we're looking at is what the propulsion is going to look like in the next couple of years. And we're going to need to move towards an electric propulsion, some sort of electric, hybrid drive, diesel electric, whatever it is we're going to have to move towards. And it's going to be incremental to move away from combustion altogether. But what do we need? What size motor are we going to need? What's the battery bank that's going to be involved? What's the backup generator going to look like? And we can do those calculations theoretically based on, on our tonnage and water line and the like. But nobody's been getting actual pull tests about what it's, going to, what it's going to take. And so we actually towed the ship at hull speed, 11 and a half knots, with this, um, with this meter on it, checking pounds of pressure that it takes to actually move the ship and comparing them to the RPM and speed test data that we have for the Gray Marine 671 that's in it right now. So now we have actual data that we can start building systems based on in propulsion. This is an incredible um, uh, form where we can look at, at what speed do we need to pull the ship, what, what's the battery draw going to be, so how long can we go silent based on what different kind of battery configurations we can use. It's 
an incredible tool. So the process that's going to that's going to continue is we have our monthly design team meetings. Uh, we're building continued pilot programs. We're going through the new installations. We're continuing to talk about it. And we are, the goal is that by June 2014, we have a complete um, system redesigned for the ship. Now again, we're going to have to figure out how that goes incrementally as well. A lot of the systems on board are so interrelated. We have a diesel cook stove on board. That diesel cook stove, not only we use it for cooking, for baking and the like, but it also heats our hot water. And it's also the main heat source for the ship. And so once we get rid of that diesel cook stove, there's a tremendous amount of other systems that are going to be involved. So again, the interdependence, whole system, design, and thinking that's going to go along with it. And at what points do we take on these different projects is a key component to, our, to that process. So I wanted to take the opportunity to engage back with you all. Uh, thinking specifically about the blue flag scheme, those best management practices that uh, STI is looking to adopt, and I really applaud the interest and the commitment of STI to move in this direction. But it seems to me that us, working on the water every day, already having a platform of education, sometimes formal environmental education, or, or just direct sail training, uh, do we not have the opportunity, or maybe some would say even the responsibility, to be pushing the industry in this matter, to be, to be models in sustainable technology for the industry, and for the thousands of people that come sailing on our ships every year, and the millions of people that come see the ships each year. And so I wanted to kind of pose the questions back to you all in terms of your already involvement with the blue flag scheme, the work that you're doing on board the ship now or not, and what, what could be the role of sail training to start moving the industry forward in these kind of questions and topics. So I'll leave that back to you all, whether you have specific questions about the blue flag scheme and how it's working, uh, any about specifically about any of the best management practices to meet the blue flag scheme, or going further about what it's going to take to kind of push the industry, pulling the market forward, changing technology, dealing with regulation um, as we build new models.